Oh, hey. I guess I'm, I'm, I forget that I intro this thing. Hey, it is Christian, and we are doing Collider Mailbag here on Sunday. You ready for it? So am I. It is time for us to take all the questions that you guys have submitted throughout the weeks, and we're going to go through them. We're going to answer them, and it's me, myself, and the reigning movie trivia showdown champion himself, Mark Yodi Riley. What's up, Mark? How you doing, guys? Nice to see you. So good to be here on this Sunday, fine Sunday edition of Mailbag. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. And joining us as always, it's Sinead DeFries. Hello. Happy to be here. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I am really happy to be here. Okay. I don't believe you. All right, here we go. It this is time to one. read some stuff. Uh, Sinead, read some stuff. All right. Sam Dean Bobby Castile writes, Hello, Collider. A few nights ago, I rewatched Kingsman, and I agree with John Campy about how Colin Firth is the heart and soul of the film, despite all the other great things revolving around the rest of the movie. This got me thinking about Independence Day and how, for many, Will Smith is the heart and soul of that movie, despite the other things there are to like about the movie. How much of a void do you guys think is going to be felt for audience members by not having Will in Independence Day resurgence, and especially considering who they've brought on board as a new lead? Liam Hemsworth, a.k.a. the bland Hemsworth. Uh, huge. And I think it's for the reason that, that you just brought up. I don't think they replaced him with a strong enough lead. I think they could have been fine. And, and you know, I don't – Liam Hemsworth sometimes – you well, that's not true. Most of the time he's not very good. Um, but he's not the one that bothers me. It's a kid that plays Will Smith's son – so far has looked the most cringeworthy in, in, in my eyes. But again, they could both be terrible. We'll find out when the movie comes out. I think the main thing we want to see in this movie is aliens attacking and explosions, shove popcorn in your face and have a good time and make sure that you put Goldblum in there and give Bill Pullman a little to do and and let's have some fun with this movie. But I think the void will be felt by Will Smith because I don't think there's going to be that electric personality. Now, I don't think they should have paid him the money he was asking for because he doesn't have that kind of star power anymore. But... I do think that by putting in a much lesser talented actor or actors in his place to fill the void is going to be felt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like a little, I'm sad that he's not in it. Yeah. However, I don't think, I think if this movie was made two years after the original and he wasn't in it, this thing would have tanked. Yeah. I sure. think, I think there would be no have chance. Couldn't yeah. have done it. Now I think, Everybody just wants to see this thing. I think everybody wants to see this thing. Uh, the buildings blow up. I think they want Jeff Goldblum to be a nut. Uh, I think they want that big alien to, to, to come in and do its craziness with uh, Bill Pullman's character. And that's that. I think Will, Will Smith isn't going to be felt. I don't really care. You think he's felt at all? I don't really care, hmm. which is surprising. I was, I was sitting there going, yeah, I'm going to miss him. Am I? I don't, I don't really know anymore. So let me, th let me point uh, two scenarios to you. Okay. The first scenario is if both Liam Hemsworth and what do you know the kid's name is playing Will Smith's son? Yeah, uh, yeah, God, um, I can't remember. So let's say Let Jesse Usher. Let's no. say that both of them are great. Okay. Then do you think they'll f they will you'll feel Will Smith's impact that they're great? If they're great in the movie. I mean, I, I think you're going to... But no, will you miss him? Like you said, you won't miss him, but will you miss him? If, the, if those two are great actors in the whole thing and they fill the void, are you going gonna to say, okay, they had to kill him? Yeah, you know, I maybe it's just me and personal opinion. I would feel it more if Jeff Goldblum wasn't there. Sure. Because I love Jeff Goldblum. And I, there is something right now that I just feel like I haven't been affected by Will Smith lately. Right. But okay. now let's take the second scenario that these okay. two guys are terrible. Mm -hmm. and that there's no one that they got at all to fill that place, I think that you're going to wind up saying, if they are indeed the lead, they might not even be the leads. They might have a side story and Jeff Goldblum. And because Liam Hemsworth is not a guy that you watch and just, oh, my God, get him off screen. He's just not great. He's just there. He's, he's just filling there. some space. Yeah, I don't think yeah. he's like when, he, when he's in the Hunger Games stuff and when he's in um, – there was that was, – what's the movie that he did? It was a horrible movie with um, – I can't remember the name of it with uh, with Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman. Oh yeah, was that? Was that uh, oh boy, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, though, yeah, yeah. But anyway, he and even then it was like he's not good, but he's not. It's not someone who's like oh. Do you know the kid's name? Jesse T. Usher. Jesse T. Usher. What's he been in? I don't know. Let's see here, he's known for Independence yeah. Day resurgence. When the yeah. game stands tall, okay. survivors okay. remorse, teenage level up. Yeah. Okay, and I could be, and I could come back after this and say, boy, was I wrong. Do mm -hmm. not judge a performance off a trailer. I'm just telling you from what I've seen in the trailer so far, it doesn't look like there's anything there. 
But I will be the first to say, yep, this kid filled the void. And look, we got a new star on our hands. And I hope that's what I'm saying. I don't feel like I'm not, that's what I'm going to be saying. Though. Yeah, I hope so, too. But I, And I think second scenario, if these guys are awful and, and Jeff Goldblum is underutilized yeah. and it's more action over substance and you kind of walk out of there feeling a little bit empty, yeah, then I too. can see myself going, you know what? We didn't get that welcome to earth, you know, right, and right. That, that I'm missing, that fun that Will Smith did bring. In 96, he was, I mean, that was right when he popped this big superstar. And that was then, the movie. Yes. And that like, was the movie. Going to your scenario, two years later, had they done the movie without him, doesn't work because that's also the time where the movie star is the one selling the ticket. True. Uh, Sinead, did you watch Independence Day, the first one? Mm -hmm. Do you like it? Yes. And do you think that Will Smith will be missed in this one? Yeah, I mean, I think that any fans of the first one are going to, are, are bummed. I've heard it already. They're like, oh, this would be, this would be so cool if he was coming back and like, Sure, but I also, what we've seen of Resurgence so far, I don't see why that should be a huge factor right, right. now. Because I've loved all the trailers. Um, I am so stoked to see this movie. I think mm -hmm. it looks awesome in a over-the-top, perfect way. And I don't think it's going to disappoint. But I will agree with you. If it does suck, yeah. then everyone's going to say, you should have put Will Smith in right. it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. All right, what's next? Willie writes, hey, y'all. With, so with the recent casting of Michael B. Jordan in Black Panther, directed by Coogler, it made me question director-actor relationships. When directors consistently work with the same actors, does this help or hurt the film industry to see new faces and diversity? Thanks. Love the show. I understand mm. the question, I think, because when you have a, a certain director like a Scorsese who puts the same actors in movies, but it's remember, there's one role... The, the, it's starring role, sure. You could maybe he could take a shot on somebody else, but it goes back to the question that we had, I think, last week, to where we talked about when someone asked about original movies and how there's not there's all remakes and reboots. So, you know, there's a lot of original movies out there too. There are a lot of movies out there, so there yeah. are a lot of new people and new stars constantly, always building, and eventually there is a, there's a reason why now. Leonardo DiCaprio was working with Scorsese because he built himself up. They, these yeah. actors build themselves up, and there's always constantly brand new directors who are proving themselves. And then they, it's, they, they use them, they use tools that they, they use each other. As far as like, there's a tool. Uh, I'm a, I'm a director, and this actor who I'm, who I understand, who I direct well, who gets me. I'm going to use them more, and it's kind of good luck for them as well. And the same thing with the actor. This, this director understands me. I work well with him. I collaborate. He makes, he brings out my best talents. So it makes sense. It's better for the industry, I think, because you get more opportunities. I think for, I, if you look at directors who are coming up the ranks now are making the smaller movies and then get that shot. Like, look, we, we're in a place now, this never used to happen. Ryan Johnson is a guy, directed two kind of, one smaller movie, then, well, two smaller movies. Brick and yeah. Brothers Bloom. Right. And, and then, and then or, Looper. And then Looper, and then boom, gets Star Wars. Yep. Colin Tre uh, Trevorrow does Safety uh, Not Guaranteed, Jurassic World. Yep. Boom. That didn't used to happen. If you used to yeah. really have to build, you can you can prove yourself now a little bit more. But inside of of all of that, when you're on the big budget movies or you're on even smaller ones, and you start working with people, like look at Ryan Johnson and jo Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Mm -hmm. You know, so like you create these relationships, and I don't think Joseph Gordon-Levitt is necessarily taking away jobs from anybody. It's just it's a collaboration. So I understand the question, but no, I actually think that it's necessary for the creativity and artwork to kind of grow. Yeah, and I think I think it can it can actually hinder diversity and actors getting in there if a director uses one of their main actors, like like say Scorsese takes DiCaprio and throws him in a supporting role that's like maybe even. Just like a smaller role, right. just for the gag of seeing Leonardo DiCaprio show sure, up. Sure, sure. You know, that's the only way I can see it. But we're talking about Coogler is is adding in um, Michael B. Jordan as a villain in Black Panther. So the rumor goes. So that's really cool. So yeah. of course they want to work together. Same thing if Scorsese does do the Irishman with uh, De Niro and Pesci past, which I can't believe. Yeah. Um, but if he threw just some random part to Pesci, just for that, for whatever right, reason, right. because yeah, you want to open it up. You what if there's a very small role, but is very good? Like say Tom Hardy's role in Inception, he mm -hmm. kind of stood out a little bit. That was our introduction to Tom Hardy and right. kind of set him on his way. What if we didn't have that? What if Nolan threw in um, a different actor that he's always worked with, and we didn't get that chance for Tom Hardy? That's right. the only time I can see it affecting. Yeah, but even then, I mean, if you would have put Guy Pearce in there or something, though, too, it's sure. like I wouldn't have. We, no, we wouldn't have got that Tom Hardy 
performance, but it's the same thing. He's working with a guy he knows makes the role work. He, he maybe maybe it was better for the role. We don't sure. know. It furthers the movie. Maybe uh, he gets another movie and down the line. It's a butterfly effect. You really yep. don't know what happens. Yep. You know. Shane, do you have an opinion on it? Um, I mean, I I get what he's saying, mm-hmm. where it might seem like we're not giving newer actors a chance like yeah. the, the up and comers right. um, as far as like diversifying with like other huge names um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that so much because like you said I think a director knows they have an idea in their head once they take on a script of who they want to play a role I don't think Martin Scorsese would ever just be like oh, it's got to be a Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio because you know, he's great right. in everything. It's yeah. obviously because they can see how he's going to play this on screen and it works in their head. And they collaborate well. Exactly. But, I mean, it's that's a common thing. You see it a lot. Like, actors working with the same directors yeah. over and over. But that's just because they've built up a great relationship and it shows on screen. Yeah. All right. What's next? Albert writes, good morning, Collider. Hello. While trying to remain spoiler-free of all Star Wars Rogue One news, I did, a, I did spot a headline from an article about the movie reshoots and where the info came from someone on Reddit who had, quote, connections to the movie. While the info may be legit, although I have doubts about that, seems like news agencies are becoming more like tabloid news. So this made me wonder, where do y'all get your movie news information? Are certain news agencies like Variety and The Hollywood Reporter more trusted sources than others? Thanks for the awesome shows. I watch you guys every day. Well, I'm going to defer to Mark Riley here because he is the one with his nose in this off, uh, all the time. And now this doesn't just this comes from various jobs as editor in chief on places and, and senior yep. editor and managing editors on different websites that you've worked on in the past. But now you are the guy that goes through, collects the news um, and gives them to whether it's my, myself, Dennis or Ellis before we do movie talk yep. every week. So why don't you go ahead and answer that question? Well, first off, Variety and The Hollywood Reporter and The Wrap are the most trusted sources, and I would say Deadline as well. Um, if if it's coming from them, you trust them. Now, sometimes they can get misinformation or not necessarily misinformation. What happens is that, like, uh, my perfect example is when Joaquin Phoenix was up for Doctor Strange. He was up for that role. The rap, Jeff Snyder, reported on it. It was moving forward. Then negotiations fell apart. He moved on. Benedict Cumberbatch came in. That was true at the time. So you could trust that, that that was actually happening behind the scenes. Now, I will say that there are, and I'm not going to call them outlets, there are websites that might make up something just to have some hits on their website. That happens a lot. Do not ever trust Reddit. I'm sorry. If somebody goes in there and says, oh, I know people, and posts on Reddit, why aren't you working at The Hollywood Reporter? Right. Why aren't you working at Variety? Do not trust them. There might be a nugget in there every once in a while. That's true. Maybe somebody decides to have a but bad day. It could be day. anybody. It could be anybody. But, I mean, overall, if you hear the rap, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, or Deadline, those are trusted, trusted sources. And then there are websites out there that have a great track record. We talked about the playlist today on Movie Talk, or uh, on Slash. Friday. Um, Slider. Uh, we talked about, uh, yeah, Slash is pretty good. Um, Collider's pretty good. Collider's pretty, <laughs> Collider's damn good. Um, who else is out there? Uh, Latino Review has had some hits with some scoops. Uh, who yeah. else? Well, Schmoes I mean, No at one point had a Yeah, we hits. don't do movie news anymore, but I, I think, but the, look, the thing is, um, when you go back to Variety, Hollywood Reporter, and the trades, the other thing is that studios are giving them information. Yep. A lot of times, like that's where it comes more of the, the news outlet is because they get their information straight from the source. Now, like Riley was saying, there are absolutely a lot of websites that are out there are on like like Steve Weintraub has a lot of different sources that he that are legit and, and guys like Steve Weintraub and um Elmi Ingbe and uh Peter Skeletal over at um, Slash Film, Slash Film yeah. all, all those guys they if you and Drew McWeeny over here if you talk to these guys they are guys they are they they do the research they make sure before they run stories that they do the they're, they're making the phone calls too and they're making sure like they before they put an actual scoop out there it's not just to get the hits now it is about the hits let's not fool one another it's about the hits sure. but it's not but they're not going to risk the integrity of their sites Absolutely. in order to just put it out there so but that being said, there are certainly many places that just do. They have a little bit of information. They don't do the research, and then they just throw it up there and go, oh, we can get some traffic here, and it might not be true at all. And that's kind of one of the things that happened with this Rogue One stuff with Macquarie. Yeah. Now, 
he called out the blogs and he called out for doing research first and it was actually directed at Slash Film who then Peter just then followed up with him they had a conversation about it they hashed out and it was a very respectful kind of exchange that, I, that we talked about in Jedi Council this past week sure. so it's just a matter on how things are done yeah yeah, yeah. alright what's next Nelson writes, Hey guys, I was rewatching Kill Bill and I came to the conclusion that Oren Ishii's origin story in Kill Bill Volume 1, the animated segment, is my favorite origin story ever. It's just perfect the execution, the story itself, and how flawlessly it sets up the badassness of the character. So I was wondering, what do you think is the best or what's your favorite origin story ever? Greetings from Portugal. Uh, it's a great origin story. Oren Ishii! love that the way that they did that the music everything about that that's a great call um i'm not gonna say it's my favorite origin story but one that i would like to bring to give credit to i thought deadpool the way that they yeah. handled deadpool was great it's a good um, call. because yeah. for deadpool it's a story like not only the rated r action but it's a, it was not a character that a lot of people were familiar with you know like even iron man at the time like wasn't maybe as familiar with besides hardcore fans um deadpool people were like, what the hell is this is he an x-men like who is is a foul mouth what rated r super what am i watching here right and the, the way that they set it up with the relationship with his girlfriend and then the cancer and just everything the way that it was put together i thought it was a really well done adaptation straight from the comics into the movie so yeah i'd say deadpool yeah, and I would say my favorite all time is the original Superman movie. 1978. 1978 Superman, because what Donner did, it's also beautiful. You have the first part of the movie is a sci fi movie when you learn about Krypton, what's going down with Krypton, Marlon Brando, Jorel's character, how he lets Kal El go. And then the second part of the movie, you have a Norman Rockwell painting coming to life in Smallville as young Clark Kent figures out meant for better things he gets a calling he goes he creates the fortress of solitude and then the third part of the movie you're in the comic book right. but it took its time in so many different ways to create superman we didn't get it with man of steel i still like man of steel but they did a different kind of origin story they did flashbacks it was kind of, some people didn't like it i personally liked it had to distinguish itself from the original superman but my favorite yeah superman and then i would say batman begins great origin yeah it was a good way to kind of to do it because it, that's that's the trick when you've done it once so many different times yeah is that how do you do it differently yeah and because i actually do think that batman v superman did batman pretty well the way that they handled it yeah i mean well they just jumped right in they with did it. And I, and, but they, and, the fla- it was through the flashback yeah it was, and it, was, it, it was it was pretty much telling us we know that you've seen it a million times but just just to give you an idea it's, it's still very prominent in this guy's life these events you should see it in our version. I thought that part of it was done really well. No, and I really liked it too because visually it was stunning yeah. and it was a different kind of way that we haven't seen yet before. So I did like it. Sinead, do you have an origin story that you really liked? Um, I mean, growing up when I was younger, I really liked the first uh, Spider-Man like a lot. Yeah. Oh, I um, love that. Uh, Tobey Maguire. And I think also most of it has to do with the fact that I was, I, I never saw another Spider-Man movie after that that really did what the first Spider-Man did for me. Mm-hmm. I loved that movie so much. Um, also, Captain America, I love that movie. I think that their attention to like detail and just going so deep into his plot, I like his origin, I think, the most because it's just so like vast and wide. But I will say Deadpool is great because um, I knew zero, nothing yeah. about yeah. the character, and they gave him a life, they gave him stakes, they gave mm-hmm. him relationships, and I truly fell in love with a character that I literally knew nothing about. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, you, you could I mean, you could argue episode four if you wanted to, too. Luke's origin Luke's story. Luke's origin, yeah. yeah. I would say that's great. Yep. His origin story finally finishes in Jedi, yeah. I would say. Well, and becoming we a full-fledged Jedi. Yeah, well, we don't know if it ends there. We don't it's know. true. It, right. It's not going to end no. there. All right, <laughs> what's, uh, what's next? Stuart writes, Howdy, Collider crew. I love everything you put out and can't wait to see Collider Nightmares. Anyway, there seems to be an unprecedented amount of hate for the Ghostbusters remake, and I can't really understand it. The movie looks fine, and the trailers really aren't awful. I don't believe it can all be chalked up to sexism, so it made me conclude that it must be nostalgia. People, myself included, adore the original and can't ever see anything replacing it. So my question is this. When has nostalgia for a property or actor greatly affected your opinion on a film? 
Mine was The Karate Kid. The original is one of my childhood classics, and I absolutely abhorred the new one based on principle and Jaden Smith's acting. But it was undeserved, and I've learned to appreciate that movie for what it is. Your thoughts? Thank uh, you. Good, uh, good, good question. question. Yeah. And because I also, what I said, I'm not going to see The Karate Kid when it comes out. I mean, there's no way. It's not a bad movie. It's not. It's not. It was unnecessary. Yeah. Shouldn't have been done. We didn't need it. But it wasn't bad. And Jaden Smith, uh, as awful as he was in After Earth, he was good in Karate Kid. And Jackie Chan was good. Uh, so, yeah, that, that I can understand the nostalgia thing getting in the way there for sure. Um, but I would like to address the Ghostbusters thing. I think it's kind of a mixture of all. I think that some, I think there are some people that just won't see it because it's women. I think that's absolutely, yep. that, that's some people. Yep. But I don't think that's the majority of people. I yeah. think the majority of people, including myself, saw that trailer and said, that looks awful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. It's not because of nostalgia. Because I'll tell you what, I had, I, I am, I had hope that that movie could be good. And, and because I like Paul Feig a yep. lot. I like what Paul Feig has done with Kristen Wiig in the past. I like what Paul Feig has done with Melissa McCarthy in the past and has proven that he knows these women and how to get good stuff out of them. But you're talking about the trailer. And this was a conversation I had with somebody where they said, how can you judge a movie based on a trailer? What I'm saying is I don't for. that trailers are there for you to judge whether or not you want to see the movie. Now, you shouldn't make an opinion saying that movie stinks because you don't know. You haven't seen the movie yet. But you can certainly say, I think this movie is going to stink because mm -hmm. what I've seen so far in the trailers makes me think there's nothing that looks very funny. Now, you say that you don't think that it was it looked terrible. I think it looked awful from the, the last trailer was fine. The international was OK, but from the majority of it. To me, it looks awful, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm going in rooting for it to be good because of nostalgia. I want the legacy to go on, and I want this brand new Ghostbusters to kind of carry on. It's not the same timeline. It's a reboot, but I want it to be good. I, I am rooting for it. As far as what movies were remade that I said, this movie is just going to stink on principle, most of them have. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I, one that I I said, no, what are you making this movie for was Footloose. And Craig Brewer, Good, yeah. who directed Hustle and Flow, did it. And I liked it. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. fought, I fought it at first. I'm like, no. And then I'm like, well, I actually did. It's not a great movie, but it's it's a it's fun. It's mm -hmm. fine, and it's a I think it's a good remake. So that's one I would choose. Yeah, you you stole mine. Good. Footloose was I love the original. Yeah. I watched that over and over again when I was growing up. And so when the the remake was coming out, I'm like, what the hell is go? Right. What is this? Who is this kid? And it's damn good movie. I've really enjoyed it. The other one that I went in really judging it before, mm -hmm. and then hating it even more after was the Halloween remake. Oh um, yeah. Because I just, it's my favorite horror movie of all time. And I go into this with an open mind, but really upset that they were remaking Halloween. Mm -hmm. And it just was awful. So I, I guess that you can't really use that as an example. But as um, far as Ghostbusters, I want to comment on that. Yeah. I think, um, Sony, yeah, you, you kind of said everything I wanted to say. Sony's not doing itself any favors with this marketing. Um, but I think people, in the end, need to give it a chance. Right. And I'm giving it a chance based on my love. For the original do so. you have any remakes that you had heard of and you said you know what this is I, there's no reason for this I, I hate this already and then you see it and you're like that wasn't that bad um no, no i guess not not i mean i just think of the bad ones stand out to me but one that always stands out to me is um uh, nightmare on elm street oh mm. yeah that remake was the worst thing i have so seen bad, ever yeah. it was just absolutely terrible right. um but the whole thing with ghostbusters too mm -hmm. like we were adults, okay? So I'm like on the younger end of the Collider. I, I am the younger end Rub of the Collider in. crew. Rub it in. Um, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> movies have to be remade. I, I, people were like, why do they keep, you know, they crap all over a franchise by remaking it or rebooting it? But it's like, the, it has to come full circle. If a story is good enough to be made into a movie, like Ghostbusters, like Footloose, like the Halloween movies, then you have to appeal to the next demographic. That's just how the world works. I think sometimes that's true. And like, I, but the more time passes, I think it becomes more acceptable. Yeah. Something like Nightmare on Elm Street, I would, didn't see the need for it just yet. Yeah. Um, something like um, Ghostbusters, I also don't see the need for it just yet. Yeah. But 
all of that aside, the reason why people aren't looking forward to Ghostbusters has nothing to do with nostalgia. It right. is because the trailer is bad. Mm -hmm. No offense to this person, but I hated that trailer. Right. I thought it was absolute cheese, and it wasn't. There's nothing about that movie that I didn't laugh once or giggle once. I agree. Um, but yeah, I think that remakes it needs to happen. All right, what's next? Ethan writes, I've noticed that Batman v Superman and X-Men Apocalypse have lower Rotten Tomatoes scores than Daredevil and The Last Stand, respectively, despite both being considered in a higher regard by most fans of either Ben Affleck or the X-Men franchise. Is this a reflection of critics increasing their expectations of superhero movies as films like The Dark Knight and Civil War constantly raise the bar as far as quality goes? Or could it just be that BBS and Apocalypse are, as the studios and creators love to say, for the fans, not the critics? Cheers. Uh, it's a great question, but I think that I think that sometimes, sometimes there certainly are movies where critics go in, just want to judge it. It's not for them at all, and they just come out giving it a bad score. Definitely happens. I, um, I I can't remember what the movie is. That there was a movie that I remember seeing. I'm like, well, they just this definitely wasn't for this particular critic, and they were not. They were judging it. They're trying to crack it down like and it was an Orson Welles movie and it was just like a complete silly movie. I can't remember what the hell the movie was. But as far as Batman v Superman goes, I don't want to get open this can of worms again. You know, I just don't want to go down this road. But it's just uh, it, it it didn't it wasn't just fans. I mean there was there was a thing it, it did a lot and we're wait we're gonna we're really all waiting to see what this extended cut is. It's gonna it's gonna really start up a whole brand new conversation of crap, I'm sure. But but it's or Maybe a bunch of people coming on the other side, but I think that the answer to the question is that there's sometimes that there are movies that are made that critics just are not going to like no matter what, and that's why a movie can do so well and uh, financially, and even though critics hate it. But then there's sometimes that you got to accept that a movie's just not that good. What do you think, Riley? This is an interesting question, and because I I did look Last Stand, I despise. I think it was awful. I think it was a rush to, to get the sequel made after Brian Singer left, so it didn't hit. But it has a way higher score than Batman v Superman, and I do believe Batman v Superman is a better movie. It is, yeah. It's absolutely a I better agree movie. With that too. So I don't know what to think yet. This is a good question in my mind. I am having some trouble trying to figure it out because I do believe that there is a lot of hype that goes especially for Batman v Superman that you're going in wanting perfection you're wanting the hype to match you're you're wanting it to be so damn good and then when it didn't hit that hype that level of of, of whatever you might have put in your head then i do not believe that batman v superman deserves a 27 percent. no i agree with you. versus a 57 uh for last stand yeah so i do i will say that i believe people walked in um and and were a little bit harder on it mm -hmm. also realize that though, see i think that it's more here, here's the argument. If you want, to, let's just talk about X Men: The Last Stand versus Batman v Superman. Here, just sure. those two, just those two movies. Okay, on a Rotten Tomatoes score. Mm -hmm. Remember this: a lot of people may or may not know this. In order for a movie to get fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, it's got to be three or above out of five. Okay. Okay. So personally, I think Batman v Superman. I think I gave it. I might have even given it three. So I would have rated it fresh. Okay. Okay. So then you have. X Men: Last Stand, I would probably put at a two, okay. and I think that the, what that means is that more people went over and gave threes, three and a half, and that to me is the insane part: is that X Men got that many over threes, which is crazy. Um, I can see Batman v Superman going under that three. I can see that. Sure. I understand I can that. I can. But I think that they should be more on the same level. Then, as far I mean, because Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade is at like eighty or something ridiculous. It should be that movie should be, but like it's still should be hundred percent. It's better than X Men. It's better than X Men. Um, not Last. Did I say Last Crusade? You said Last Crusade. I did not oh, mean Last Stand. <laughs> I did not mean Last Crusade. I mean no. I meant uh, Crystal Skull. Got Crystal it. Skull. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Crystal Skull is at like eighty-seven percent or something. Really? Man, Check it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. what I meant. And Crystal Skull should be. In the, it should be X Men Last Stand on it's scraping the toilet bowl, and then right right above it, standing on its head is um, the Crystal Skull, and then I think Batman v Superman should be standing on its head. So that's where I would go. Something occurred to me when we're talking Last Stand. That's a 
few years ago. Yeah. How, how many years? I can't remember. Like but last stand in 2006. 2006. Are there more critics now registered on Rotten Definitely. Tomatoes? 100%. Okay. So if they are voting, so more not, more critics uh, are, are now, there's more chance to do a lower score of three. So yes. that will affect the rating. Mm -hmm. Yes. You would, you, you, that's a great point because if you look now, you, right now, if you went over Rotten Tomatoes and you see how many reviews make mm -hmm. up that score on Batman v Superman, I bet you it is significantly different than Last Stand. Check that out right now. Yeah, I bet it, you. I bet that's. I, I bet that's, that's a, a big. It's a reason big for thing it. because no, the blogs haven't hadn't blown up. The this right. Yeah. What's the, what's the score? So Batman v Superman is at a twenty seven percent. How many reviews? And where did I find? Stop up pop up ads. Um, what are we looking at here? I can't even see. It's great air. Keep talking. Okay. Keep talking. All right. Keep talking. So, but the point the point is that <laughs> I think that between that many reviews doing it, it definitely has a bit. I mean, it's it's a little misweighed. Okay, yeah. three hundred and thirty-five for Batman v Superman. For Batman, all critics. Okay, okay? that's three hundred and thirty-five. I'm going to go yeah. to Last Stand. Yeah, I bet you Last Stand has. You said three hundred thirty-five for Batman v Superman. I mm -hmm. bet you Last Stand has a hundred. Okay, that's what I guess. Sinead, how many you think? For last That's six this is two, years. 2006. So nine years ago. Yeah. Ten, uh, uh, no, ten. no more than I will say like 175. 234. Wow. That's surprising. Wow. To me. That is surprising. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well. Uh, and the they're weighing we like top critics is that f there's 49. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's for uh, for X Men. And yep. then if we go back to Batman v Superman, I want to see what they do for top critics. Okay. Which. Um, 49 again so i guess wow. they just do 49 so all maybe right, right. maybe it's all balancing out all right well there you go all right what's next sean right hey collider crew huge fan of every one of you movie nerds and enjoy everything you put online so here's my question is there an actor or actress that you first thought was miscast in a film someone whose previous roles didn't seem to fit into what this movie was calling for only to completely blow you away and change your mind about that person's talent as a performer. For me, it was Matthew Lillard in SLC Punk. His previous roles in Scream and Hackers at the time did not prepare me for his portrayal of Steve-O, a young punk struggling to manage his ex existential crisis in 1980s Salt Lake City. Thanks for all that you do to keep the rest of movie nerds entertained and informed. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will say there's two of them. The, well, there's more than two, but the two that I've been pretty vocal about. The first is Shia LaBeouf, formerly known as Shia LaBoots to me. Um, a lot of it is because of his personal stuff, too. But there's a lot of times where was when I see those Transformers movies and the big budget movies. And no, 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 no. And just like not really caring. And then he's talking smack about directors. And, and then I see him in Fury. Mm -hmm. And you had seems great. You, and other movies, too. You can't. He's in it. An yeah. amazing actor, like a tremendous actor, and I'm. I don't know the per. I don't know the man. I can't really say whether or not I would hang out with him. Um, I have no idea. That's not what we're talking. We're talking about as far as his performances have gone. He is a great actor. I like that he's going over these smaller roles and more personal roles now. I think the John McEnroe casting is brilliant and yeah. genius. The other one is Jai Courtney. Um, mm -hmm. Jai Courtney, when he's in starring roles, I have been vocal. I think is terrible. I think he was really bad in Terminator Salvation. I think that he was, was even though the movie wasn't his fault, totally miscast in, in Die Hard as John McClane's son. Um, he has been bad in a lot of stuff. That it, it, and it's not just bad. It's just, I, I think the word more is boring and just kind yeah. of vanilla. But then you take him in these smaller movies like The Water Diviner, and you take him in a movie, The um, uh, Unbroken. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I've seen so far, again, in, just in a trailer in Suicide Squad, and you go, well, wait a minute. Yeah. I, I, there's, there's talent there. There's a lot of talent. Then another guy that's under the same thing is a, um, uh, what's, what's um, uh, not Sam, I was going to say Sam, Sam Worthington. Worthington. Sam yeah. Worthington. He's another guy. Sam Worthington was a guy in the beginning where they said, there's your new movie star. There's your movie star. We're gonna we're gonna give you a movie star. What do you think? And we're like, and and public just rejected him because yeah. don't just tell us who the movie star was because Terminator. And then he he popped in Avatar, but then he was in a couple other things. But then you see him in movies like Clash of the Cake, Lines. and then he was in Everest, right? Uh, but he's a guy. Those guys I think have a lot of talent if used in the right way. And Taylor Kitsch is another one. Yeah, I think the most classic example of miscast and then. Turning it around is Tom Cruise is the vampire Lestat in Interview with the Vampire. Oh wow, you didn't like him in that? Well, when he was cast, everybody, including me, well, and Anne, Anne Rice, Anne Rice took a yeah. full page ad yeah. out on Variety yeah. and said, "Get this guy out of here. Mm -hmm. He's no vampire Lestat." 
and then took another full page ad out when the movie came out and said, sorry, you were great. And that's where I go to because I, I love the books. I read all the books. So when he was cast, I was like, you do not put Tom Cruise as Vampire Lestat. That is horrible casting. He's not perfect. No, totally miscast. And I see the movie and he crushes it. Yeah. He is so good as Vampire Lestat. And I ate my words. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Speaking of eating words, I remember on Schmoes about two years ago. Okay when the news came that Ben Affleck was going to be Batman. Yes, um, absolutely. And because of, he's certainly had good performances in the past, but he's also had some awful ones. Mm -hmm. And we saw what he did as Daredevil. Um, and we've seen him in reindeer games yeah. and other things. And I, and I remember saying, and this is after he directed a bunch of stuff. And I said, he's just not the guy to do it. Mm -hmm. And he was the best thing in Batman v Superman. Yeah. He was the best thing. He was great in the role and he blew me away as Batman. And one of the better ones, I still think Bale's my favorite, but I think, Ben Affleck is in the conversation. Yeah. Shane, do you have any performances of people that you saw originally? Ah, this guy stinks, or this girl stinks, and then <clears throat> wound up liking them? Yeah, not necessarily like miscast, but I didn't have a lot of hope for Keanu Reeves in John Wick. Mm. I don't, mm. I never. It's a, good one. it's a good one, yeah. Yeah, I never really thought that he was worth much hype or anything, mm -hmm. and I always kind of regarded him as one of my worst actors in Hollywood. Um, but I freaking love John Wick, and I love Keanu Reeves as John Wick. And I think it worked perfectly. All right. What's next? Bryce Ratliff writes, Hey, Collider Crew. Thank you for all of the great content you are all working so hard on. I have seen X-Men Apocalypse seven times in the movie theater since its release on May 27th. Wow. And I plan to see it again soon. I also saw Kingsman, The Secret Service, ten times wow. in theaters wow. back in 2015. When I really fall in love with the film, I am really passionate about supporting it and enjoying it as much as I can in the best way possible in the movie theater. What is a movie that you love so much that you felt the need to go back to the theater and rewatch it multiple times? And how many times did you see it total? Man, you know, this is a question I wish Campia was here for. That dude sees m movies mm -hmm. multiple times more than any. I mean, he saw like Ant Man like six times, which is really? a movie. Yeah, he sees, he goes back and rewatches movies over and over and over again. Um, I don't do it as much now like I used to. Yeah. Only because I am married with a kid. And for me, it is tough. I'm able to go like, because when you talk to most married people with children, it's like, we don't get to go to the movies anymore. I get to do it because it's my job. Yeah. And I go, like, yeah. I'm able to do it for press screenings and stuff too. And then when my wife and I go out, we go to see it. So it's normally about a one time thing for me. But when I definitely saw Force Awakens in the theater six times, I found a way to go see it six times. I actually saw The Phantom Menace uh, six times. Um, and I was drinking the Kool Aid and telling myself that it was a good movie back then. But still, yeah. uh, Kingsman, I actually saw three times in the theater. When there's a movie that I really enjoy, I will try to, I, I wanted to see Civil War again the second time. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is if I see like a press screening and my wife's not able to make it, then I really love it a lot. I want her to go see it in the theater because she can, she could wait for sure. things to as far as But if not, I'm like, you should go and see that in the theater. And um, I think uh, Winter Soldier I did that with, with mm -hmm. her. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes I thought three times. So yeah, when it's a movie I really enjoy, I'll go back and see it a couple of times. Yeah, I had a lot of those. Force Awakens I saw five times in the mm -hmm. theater finally. Um, I think Avengers I went back and saw three times in the theater. Um, I'm going to do Conjuring again tonight. I already saw the press screening. I want to see that again. So I'm going tonight. Um, but I go back to the years between 1984 and 1985. I saw Gremlins in the theater probably seven or eight times. Wow. Oh, yeah. I went back over and over again for Gremlins. That I lost my mind over that movie, as well as Ghostbusters the year before in 1984. Gremlins was 1985, I believe. And... Um, or maybe it was this, no, same year. Ghostbusters and Gremlins were 1984. Ghostbusters I saw probably five or six times. Yeah. It was just like over and over again. I remember wearing a hat mm -hmm. for Ghostbusters and having a sticker book of Gremlins. Right. And I would, sorry about this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna now come clean. I knew how to sneak into my theater. There was ah. a door that was open. I would sneak in and watch these movies over and over again. Well, there you go. That's I worked at a movie theater mm -hmm. and I saw Braveheart so many times I can't even yeah. tell you it's got to be in the 10 to 15 times because I never I mean I just would go in we this theater when I tell you it was like a rundown it shouldn't have been operating uh, this theater was so bad in Queens <laughs> neither was this theater that I went this to this place was it, it was like hooligans working in this place and like one day I'm going to tell all the stories about it and write a book about it but it was a it was one of these things it's like this is how this cra crappy the management and everything was too I'd be working at this working at this place and Braveheart's a three hour movie and I yeah. probably watched Braveheart once or twice and then my shift was over. <laughs> like, and like nobody asked where I was. Um, but I, I would it's do a good that. Jo dream oh, job there. Awesome. It was the best. And then I fooled myself 
by moving out. When I moved to Florida, I was like, oh, I'm going to go work in a movie theater again. And it was like actually like a legit theater. Yeah. And it was like, no, you, no, what are you doing? You can't nap. You know, so I'm like, oh, so uh, is there any, anything that you, uh, you can't had, nap? <laughs> you can't nap. What are you doing? Yeah. I'm like, what, what am I supposed to be doing? I don't know. Serve popcorn. Like, he doesn't want any. Your job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a multiple watcher. Yeah. I'm really not. Um, I mean, I have a five month old child. Right. It's so hard. I don't yeah, hard. see the light of day most of the time. Right. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, I'm not a multiple watcher. I think I've seen, like, recently I saw Civil War twice. Okay. But I, before mm -hmm. that, I, I can't remember the last time I went back to a movie theater to watch a movie again. Okay. Um, all right. What's next? Is that it? Last one? That's it. That's, That's it. it. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today on Collider Mailbag. I'd like to thank the panel that joined me today. First, Mark Yodi Riley. Where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram. And coming up this Tuesday, two days, we have the second episode of Collider Nightmares. I'm so excited. Please check that out. Our host, Clark Wolf. Joins uh, and me, John Schnepp, Perry Nimeroff. We are joining, and I can't wait for it. And then Friday, or coming up in July, there is going to be a big Schmodown title match where I get to take on Dan Merrill from Screen Junkies. When is that? I don't know. When isn't it? July. Isn't it July? July. Yeah. yeah. I think we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So July. I can't wait for that. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna go toe to toe with Dan, and I am totally looking forward to that. So. And joining us, Sinead DeFries, where can I find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at thatsoshinead.com. On Mondays, I'm here for Collider TV Talk, on Fridays for Movie Talk, and Mailbag over the weekends. And for me, Christian Harloff, you can find me at Twitter, Instagram. You can also find me every Thursday on Jedi Council as well as Movie Talk. Like Mark mentioned with the Schmodown, you can find my match with Andy Signore. It was up on Friday, so go and check that out. And get ready for that title match. We'll be talking about it. It's going to happen. It'll be in July. More information. Keep checking my Twitter. Thank you, guys. And we'll catch you on Movie Talk tomorrow. Hey, guys. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.